Good morning and welcome to our Lord's Day service, and we do hope that the service is a blessing to you. It's a joy to welcome back Katie Dahl. She has been such a stalwart here for these many months, and we're so delighted that she is willing to share her talents with us. We're so pleased to have Hal Halverson with us and Colin Welford. And I'd like to welcome Kay Channon, who will be our lay reader today. Now, Kay and Keith are members of the church, and they're here usually from May through October. Kay is an artist, and everything that she touches, she brings that artistic touch. When we'd have fellowship hours here, her tables were just amazing. You didn't want to eat because they were so beautiful. And you'll have to ask her someday about her 100 ingredient salads. They are a work of art. Uh, Keith and Kay are known for magnificent dinner parties and for some mean bridge playing, but I'll let them explain that to you some other time. For our other announcements, we're going to begin parking lot Bible studies this week. It will be Thursday at 1 o'clock. If it rains, we'll push it back to Friday, and we'll do that each week. So if it doesn't rain, it'll be Thursdays at 1, and we'll do that through mid-October until the weather gets a little colder, and then we'll have to figure something else out. We'll be studying the book of Ephesians. Let us now join our hearts to worship the Lord. Our watchword for the week is taken from Psalm chapter 119, verse 34. Give me understanding, O God, that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Please join us in singing, Holy God, we praise your name.
come to that time of worship where we bring our prayer concerns and our praise reports. We are so delighted for Mitch Weborg and Whitney Peterson who will be joining in marriage today and we will be praying for their union. We want to wish a very special happy birthday to Eunice who's celebrating a birthday this week to Linda and George, who are celebrating 60 years of marriage this week. We want to remember in our prayers Kathleen and her family on the death of her mom, Marion. We also want to remember Kathleen's nephew. He's a, a toddler who is going in for kidney surgery next month. His name is Aiden. We want to remember the family of Jeffrey Price, uh, Jeff died suddenly this past week. And we ask for prayers for the entire family. We want to remember all of those who are caregivers, who are caring for their loved ones, and those caregivers who are doing such wonderful work in our hospitals. We want to remember those who are struggling with cancer, Dean, Angela, and Rhea. Angela is a friend of the Carries. And we want to remember young Jade and Michael in our prayers. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful that we could be here today, so thankful for your grace, your mercy, your kindness toward us. We're so grateful for the love which brought Mitch and Whitney together, and we ask that you bless their marriage today. We're so grateful that you have given Eunice another year of life. We ask that she would remember her birthday in joy this week. For Linda and George, as they mark a 60th year of marriage, we're so grateful for their love for each other, and we ask that you would continue to bless and guide them. Lord, we are grateful that Marion was ushered peacefully into your nearer presence. We ask that you would provide comfort and healing for Kathleen and her family. Friend of little children, be with young Aiden as he faces surgery. Grant to he and his parents your peace and your comfort and healing mercy. We lift up before you, Jade and Michael. We thank you for the love that has brought him to this moment in time, and we ask that you would continue to be with that young boy. We ask that you would be with the family of Jeffrey Price as they mourn his sudden loss, that you would grant to them your peace and your strength. For all of those who are lending aid this day, that you would grant to them strength beyond themselves. We ask that you would be with those who are dealing with cancer treatments for Dean, for Angela and for Rhea, that they might know that underneath them are the everlasting arms. We commit ourselves to you this day, for we ask it in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is. 
how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone. The day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in drunkenness or deblancy or quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Our second scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosened in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. dark it seems I feel it coming up inside of me and I feel it in you too in everything we do the next time you see me we'll both be laughing yeah just to be alive we are learning to shine on Oh, no. 
The reflection is written by Pastor Dan Olson. Jokingly, it has been said that people go to church to confess everyone else's sins. Hopefully, that's not true, but it does make a point. It is true that we tend to see the speck in any another's eye and not the lag in our own. This implies, of course, that I'm right and you're wrong, and that's just simply all there is to it. Sadly, this describes life as we know it just now. I don't remember a time when we have been so divided and splintered as people and as a nation. Frankly, I find it very scary and dangerous. It seems as if our very democracy is in peril. There seems to be no middle ground and people take sides and attack others for their race, positions, thoughts, their faith. We are confronted these days with a killer pandemic, racial inequality, environmental disasters, and coming to terms with shifts in political power, in public health, and in free speech. If these aren't enough to fracture us, I don't know what is. We've come to the place when we are in mental and emotional overload, and even our faith can be shaken. I remember being placed in the playpen as a child, and as parents, we did the same. A playpen is a safe and cozy place, but if we escape, there could be danger lurking. God's gift of the Ten Commandments is like that. They provide safety and the joy of living in harmony. But if we step beyond the Ten Commandments, we are in peril of having our lives and our love for one another erode beyond recognition. That's where all the trouble begins. We must listen when the Apostle Paul reminds us to love our neighbor as ourselves. He says, he goes on to say that we must lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Light, live honorably as in the day, not in quarreling and jealousy, but instead put on the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for all people. That truly is the only hope for us to build bridges between people instead of barriers so that we may talk and not quarrel, where we can agree rather than dis be disagreeable. May it be so. May it be so. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Lord, I ask that all my words and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Christ our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I think most of us live by sound bites, especially in church, especially in the Christian walk. We, there's a few verses that we like to take and make them our mottos, and we like, love to take things out of context and live by those sound bites. And there's a particular sound bite that I want to talk to you today. It's at the very end of the gospel reading for this day. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. That's a wonderful sound bite. We preacher types like to quote that when there's very few people in church to remind them that it's still okay because Jesus is here. Some like to remind the bride and groom about that, and there's a lovely song that talks about where two or three are gathered in God's name, that there is love. You remember that song? It's a great sound bite. But it really has very little to do with what Jesus intended. It's not about gathering a small group in worship so we feel better about ourselves because Jesus is even around if there's only two or three in worship or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight today. It's talking about something much deeper than that. And that's the danger with sound bites. They might make us feel good, but if we really want a depth in our lives, we have to dig deeper. And this particular passage is so difficult that a lot of people really don't want to deal with it. And those who do deal it with it in a very legalistic way. You remember the passage? It's about when there are church fights or church arguments or somebody does something against someone and so you have a formula to follow. But we miss the whole point. The point is not, well, you know, I have a rule book here, so let's see, if somebody sins against me, first I go to them privately, and then I bring, uh, I bring back up, and then if that doesn't work, I bring more back up, and if that doesn't work, I shun you. That's not what it's about. The reason that the Lord of glory, the reason that the one who died and rose again talked about this was not to say, check the boxes off, but to say our relationships are so vitally important that when there is a conflict, we are not to just sweep it under the rug or go Wisconsin nice and not say a thing or just leave people alone. We are to confront it head on because the relationship is so vitally important. And when you go to that brother or sister that you're concerned with, when you go and there's two, who's with them? Jesus, in that conflict. When that doesn't work and you have to bring somebody else in, we call that in modern terms an intervention. And when you're staging an intervention because you're so vitally concerned with this person, and you bring other people in, Jesus is with that. And then when that doesn't work and you have to have a bigger intervention, Jesus is there. And when that doesn't work, when he said, you've got to regard that person like a Gentile or a tax collector, and the church has interpreted that as, we've got to excommunicate, we've got to shun, and they forget what did Jesus do with Gentiles and tax collectors? You remember? He had dinner with them. He embraced them. He said, God so loved the world. And that is what we are to do when we cannot get through to our brother or our sister. And the relationship is fractured. And we know we're not going to convince them 
of their error. We don't push them away. We love them even more deeply, as Jesus did. That's why Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, when you're going into that conflict, I'm there with you because it's important. Don't sweep it under the rug. Let it out. And if there's no resolution, you still love that one until journeys end. We're coming into a very fraught season. Along with everything else, there's a major election that's going to happen in November. Now, I have to tell you, in my house, elections were like intramural sports, and we took sides. And my father was on the side that was completely against my side. He thought I was deluded, and he told me so. I thought he was deluded, and I didn't say it because I had to respect my father. But we'd go at it, and we'd, we'd go round and round with it. But you know, at the end of the day, after the votes were cast, one of us was gloating and one of us wasn't. It didn't matter to me what my dad's politics were when I needed comfort or advice or just a shoulder to cry on. When I needed his presence, it did not matter that I disagreed with just about everything he believed in politically. It didn't matter to my dad when he could no longer climb stairs and that crazy, deluded daughter would have to help him up the stairs by grabbing his belt and walking him upstairs. It didn't matter to him what my politics were when I was helping him get dressed in the morning. You see, relationships are so much more important than our political stances. And for those of us who want to persuade others, you and I both know, no matter how logical your argument is, if someone has a staunch opinion, they're not going to change it because you throw logic at it. And it's okay to express an opinion, but do not let that opinion ruin a relationship. And do not Wrap yourselves with people who only agree with your point of view. Because then our lives are shallow. There's a richness in conflict. There's a richness when I'm with someone who might not agree with me. This is the God who created us and created us so differently. And what divides us, God says, he's going to bring us together in love. And that's what this verse is all about, where two or three are gathered in my name, even when we disagree, even when we get ugly, even when there's conflict, I am there. So the next time you have to do an intervention, or the next time you know you, something's going to be brought up that you do not agree with, why don't you bring friend Jesus with you? Be conscious that he is there. And may the peace of God be with us all. Let us pray. Lord, I'm so grateful for the variety you've given to us. So grateful that in conflict you are there. When we're arguing, you are there. When we're staging an intervention, you are there. And that you've set us into relationships to love each other in spite of our differences. And so, Lord, we pray that you will heal us this day and help us to bring you into the fray tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.